Hello and welcome to our webinar, What's in the State and Federal Budgets for Early Childhood Education and What Do We Still Need? We're very, very glad that you are joining us. Uh, please note that you can find additional early childhood webinars, including early childhood advocacy training uh, sessions on AZAEYC's YouTube channel, uh, as well as the link to this recording and the link to the handouts that will be provided as part of this training. Next slide. My name is uh, Dr. Eric Boucher. I work at the Arizona Association for the Education of Young Children, uh, which is one of our two state affiliates of NAEYC. Uh, we are so grateful to have this time to spend uh, with you to talk about what uh, is currently happening uh, in the early care and education field here in our state and nationally, and some ways that we can get involved to really elevate our voices to get the public investments that we need to support young children, families, and to have a well-supported well compensated early childhood profession. Next slide. We wanted to mention that um, this uh, session is made possible thanks uh, in part uh, to funding from a grant from the Voices for Healthy Kids, uh, which is an initiative of the American Heart Association. Uh, their funding allows us to provide this webinar as well as um, to support a policy campaign to secure uh, state investments in early care and education here in the state of Arizona. I do wanna note that you can access all of the handouts as well as the slide deck by going to this link or using the QR code. That link is bit period ly slash 0801 ECE advocacy. Please note that ECE is capitalized. Uh, this will give you access to the slide deck, which has some embedded links uh, to some additional resources, as well as some handouts that could help you in your early childhood advocacy journey. So you can either go to that link or scan that QR code. Uh, next slide. We also want to note that this is uh, a collective effort, that this uh, webinar is really put on uh, collaboratively among many early childhood agencies here in our state. Um, I do want to mention Arizona AEYC, the organization that I represent. Uh, we've partnered with the Arizona Early Childhood Education Association, the Arizona Head Start Association, Child and Family Resources Inc, uh, and the um, Child Care Resource and Referral uh, Arizona Network, uh, Children's Action Alliance, uh, Southern Arizona AEYC, and the Arizona Early Childhood Alliance, uh, which is a, um, an alliance of more than 50 early childhood agencies, businesses, and community partners all working towards supporting early childhood here in Arizona. We've also collaborated with our partners at Child Care Aware of America, so you'll be hearing from many of these partners uh, throughout today's session. Uh, we think this is important to bring up because the work that we do uh, individually, our voices individually are powerful in making change with lawmakers. But when we come together collectively to use our voices uh, to elevate the same consistent message uh, among a uh, unified message among our law lawmakers, we have power in that collective. Uh, next slide. So a couple of uh, points that we'd like you to consider as we're going throughout our time together. Uh, it's critically important that we have a shared set of, uh, of talking points as we're talking with lawmakers, as we're uh, making our voices and stories heard about our experiences as early childhood educators or as parents. So as we get started, we want to kind of set the frame, uh, set the context with a couple of points that might be helpful uh, to make a note of as you are engaging in early childhood advocacy work. First and foremost, we think about early childhood as a right, early childhood education as a right, that young children, all young children, have the right to quality, equitable, and joyful ECE. We know that uh, it's important that uh, affordable, accessible ECE is available uh, for all families, for all children, because we know it grows children's lifelong skills, it improves family well being, and overall, it enhances the vibrancy of our communities. We also know from um, looking at the data that. Quality ECE helps parents get to work, get to school, and contribute to our state's economic success. And that the ECE workforce deserves to be well supported and well compensated for their essential work. So as you hear from our special policy, uh, guest policy experts throughout today's training, you'll hear some of these themes throughout the, um, uh, throughout the training that'll help you think about some specific uh, talking points that you can use with lawmakers. 
Uh, importantly, though, you'll note that these pieces that are highlighted in orange are the uh, unified or consistent phrases we can all use as we're making that case for why early childhood needs to be publicly invested. Next slide. So a couple points. Uh, we, uh, over, the over the past few years during the pandemic, uh, the early childhood field has had some of the most significant investments we've ever had as, an, uh, as a field, as a profession. Uh, Arizona alone over the past few years received uh, nearly $1.3 billion in federal childcare relief funding that helped stabilize childcare providers and it resourced programs with the funding that they needed to improve wages, benefits, professional learning, and more, helping stabilize the child. Now these fields, uh, these funds were temporary, so they uh, begin to run out uh, in September of 2023, and they sunset fully, they're, they're completely gone by September of 2024, um, which may result in a childcare fiscal cliff of $1.2 billion. So there's a difference between what we typically get federally and then what we were able to get during the pandemic, and that fiscal cliff could be uh, a challenge uh, for child care providers and for children across our state. What does that mean, that child care fiscal cliff? Well, it means nearly 1,200 uh, early childhood providers uh, are estimated to close, uh, either because uh, of lack of funding, um, uh, they may have to raise tuition uh, for parents, uh, or they may not be able to sustain the improvements to wages and benefits, uh, which will cost uh, early childhood educated jobs. And then ultimately, if, if there isn't additional significant funding, uh, up to 99,000 Arizona children may lose access to childcare as a result of this childcare fiscal cliff, and we may lose 4,692 early childhood workforce jobs. So it's a critically urgent now, uh, especially in the next few months, to make our voices heard, tell the stories of the impact of this federal funding on children, families, and communities, um, and to get those significant sustained investments uh, in, in childcare, both at the state level as well as federal. Next slide. So that $1.3 billion was a federal appropriation. We'll hear a little bit more about the federal budget in just a moment. Uh, but let's talk about who in our state, which con Congress people voted uh, to support the American Rescue Plan Act of two, uh, 2021, uh, which included the significant majority of that child care stabilization grant uh, funding. Uh, you can see the Congress people uh, in that first column who voted yes. There's a column of uh, lawmakers who voted no for a variety of reasons. And then there are uh, some representatives that, um, because of redistricting, were not in Congress in 2021, but replaced uh, the two people in yellow there under the voted yes column. So it's critically important that we make a note of these lawmakers to thank the people who did vote yes and let them know the impact of uh, the child care stabilization grants on your program or on your community, and to reach out to those people who voted no to make sure they understand the critical importance of ECE, not just for children and families, but also for our economic success as communities. So next slide, to find out your uh, representative, uh, we are so excited to share this link. We've used this a lot in our advocacy trainings. It's from Child Care Aware of America. You can find it at um, this link here at the bottom of the screen, bit period ly slash cca find. Uh, you go to this website, you type in your address and your zip code, and it'll populate every single one of your US lawmakers, your Congress uh, people in the Senate and the House of Representatives, all the way down to some of your local elected officials, mayors, city council members. It's a great uh, resource to bookmark um, who those people are, and there are links to be able to reach their website and their contact information. So we highly encourage you uh, to make a note of that website. So without further ado, we'd like to spend some time talking about where we're at at the federal level. Uh, with ECE funding and then dig into what it looks like in our state and then have a couple of tips and tricks for you as an early childhood educator uh, to make your voice heard as an advocate. Next slide, please. Uh, so it's our pleasure to introduce two colleagues from uh, Child Care Aware of America. Um, Diane uh, Girard is currently the state policy analyst at Child Care Aware. Prior to this role, Diane was a child nutrition policy analyst with the Food Research and Action Center and an education policy analyst for the New York State Legislature. Before beginning her career in policy, Diane worked briefly in a center-based program in Massachusetts as an assistant teacher. Diane, welcome. 
Uh, we also have uh, Christina joining us. Christina Akash uh, is currently the Federal Policy Analyst at Child Care Aware of America. Her background is in federal and state education policy, and she also has experience providing direct social services to children and families. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Public Communication from American University and a Master of Social Work from the University of Maryland, Baltimore, where she was awarded the Julie Kreider Co. Award for Advocacy and Social Action. She's originally from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. So as you can hear, some great experience policy uh, experts here with us today. So uh, Diane and Christina, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Eric. Um, I'm gonna start out. Uh, hi again, everyone. I'm Christina Koch, Federal Policy Analyst at Child Care Aware of America. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, on this next slide, I'm gonna start with recapping the national debt ceiling conversations you probably remember from a couple of months ago and how they ultimately affected ECE. So in June, President Biden and Congress came to an agreement to raise the debt ceiling and prevent the US from defaulting on the federal debt. This legislation is called the Fiscal Responsibility Act and sets caps on federal funding for fiscal year 24 at around fiscal year 23 levels without adjustments for inflation. The law did include some rescissions of unspent funding and while childcare funding distributed to states is unaffected, the Office of Child Care under the Administration for Children and Families in the Department of Health and Human Services is just losing some administrative funds there. Since the passage of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, the Republican controlled House of Representatives Appropriation Committee has made some efforts to keep numbers for fiscal year 24 even lower than what was agreed upon in the debt ceiling package. However, the Democrat controlled Senate Appropriations Committee has been coming in slightly higher than the House. So we expect these negotiations to pick right back up after August recess. And so on the next slide, um, at this point in the process, we do have both the House and Senate Labor, Health and Human Services and Education or Labor H appropriation bills out. The final bill that is negotiated between the committees of both chambers will fund early childhood education programs in fiscal year 24, including the largest federal source of funding for child care, the Child Care Development Block Grant. Unfortunately, the proposed FY24 House Labor Age Appropriations numbers are much lower than what is needed for these programs to serve eligible families and would hit communities hard if passed as they are. In the House Labor Age Appropriations Bill, funding for CCBG is flatlined at the same number as last year, a little over $8 billion, which we know when adjusting for inflation is not enough, especially since this program is not currently serving every eligible child and family. It is also incredibly disappointing that Head Start and Early Head Start saw a cut of about $750 million, as well as the complete elimination of funding for the Preschool Development Grant Program. This would mean for Head Start and Early Head Start, roughly 80,000 children would no longer be able to receive these services under this proposed House Appropriations Bill. And so on the next slide, I'll go over the Senate side. The Senate Committee on Appropriations approved with bipartisan support last year, their proposed Labor Age FY24 Appropriations Bill and this bill provides a $1 billion increase for early education programs over fiscal year 23. The bill proposes $8.7 billion for CCDBG, which is a $700 million increase from FY23, and $12.3 billion for Head Start and Early Head Start, which is a $275 million increase from FY23. The preschool development grants are not cut in this bill. They are at $310 million, which is still, however, a small cut from FY23. We ultimately believe at CCAOA that the Senate prioritized childcare in this bill and the increased funding proposed is responsive to needs of families, providers, and communities. Although we know that the need is so much greater, um, but believe that these levels should be the floor of where Congress should start as they advance FY24 funding and continue the momentum towards fully meeting those needs. 
On the next slide, um, with a limited amount of funding to go around, increases for ECE programs face steep odds, um, which is why advocacy really matters right now as members of Congress make funding decisions in the coming months. Funding decisions get made in a couple of different ways. Um, members of Congress often have their own favorite programs that they champion and push for funding and also respond to pressure from advocates. It is the members of the House and Senate Labor Age Appropriations subcommittees who are making these decisions, which are a subgroup of the larger House and Senate Appropriations Committees who then vote to approve the bills that the subcommittee creates. It would be especially critical if you are a constituent of a member of Congress on these committees or subcommittees that you reach out to them about ECE funding and you can find um, the members of committees on their websites. Even if your member of, of Congress is not on these committees, the numbers in the House bill are so tight that every, every representative is really powerful right now. Committee members ultimately make the decisions, but it would be super helpful for them to be hearing from all their colleagues that they've made the wrong one. If your representative says that they won't support a bill that cuts ECE funding, it can actually have some sway. So now is the time for other members of Congress to be saying that and reaching out to the appropriators on these committees. When members of Congress come back from recess in September, it's going to be really hard to get the votes and reconcile these proposals. So your representative, no matter who it is, it's gonna be really important in this process. And speaking of timing, as I mentioned, Congress is in recess in August and members of Congress are in their districts. So this is actually a really great time to reach out and try to schedule a program site visit. CCAOA has a resource available to help walk you through that process and the importance of doing it, which is included in the resources and on this slide. Um, you can also still contact your member of Congress's office during August recess. Their staff is still in, but September is really going to be when they pick all of this back up and there's going to be a lot of tough decisions to be made. So on the next slide, I also wanted to let you know that Child Care of America has a number of resources available to help you in your advocacy. We have a number of informational one-pagers on various early education policy topics that can be used to um, educate yourself and also leave behind with a member of Congress if you end up meeting or contacting them. Um, those can be included there. One of the resources we have available on this page is about the various federal funding streams for childcare and early education and how that funding supports the system on the ground, which is really useful. We also currently have an action alert on our website that anyone can use um, that has a pre-written letter to send a message to your member of Congress asking for increases in FY24 funding. And lastly, we just had a blog post come out related to appropriations. Um, so if you'd like to read a little bit more about this, that's also available in the resources here. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Diane. Thanks, Christina. Hi, everyone. My name is Diane Gerard. Again, I'm the State Policy uh, Senior Analyst with Child Care of America. I'm just making sure I'm not muted. Great. Thank you for having me here. Um, Christina just did a really great job of sharing the big picture where we're at at the federal level. So I want to follow that up with some national data on price and supply in states. Um, a fed, what federal relief funding looks like across all states, and what we are hearing from providers nationwide about the upcoming fiscal cliff. So I think all of this data and information can help shape advocacy efforts at both the federal and state level, and I hope it inspires and bolsters your advocacy messaging and strategy over these next couple of months. The first piece of data I want to share with you comes from Child Care of America's report series called Catalyzing Growth Using Data to Change Child Care. The report includes a national analysis of child care supply and affordability data from December 2022. So a little bit of context, we gather child care price and supply data analyzed in this report from our wonderful partners at Child Care Resource and Referral Agencies um, in our annual survey each year. From this data, we calculate a national average price of child care, which we use to compare to the rate of inflation. 
2022, we calculated that the national average price of care was 10,853. And this average includes both infant and preschool prices in centers and family child care programs. And then for supply, the report includes a, an interactive map displaying state level data on the number of child care programs and license capacity of programs by type, um, CCRNR referrals and quality rating and improvement system participation. The report also includes longitudinal data on the number of child care centers and family child care homes open from 2019 to 2022. So that's a little bit about the report and how we come up with the data. But digging into the 2022 results, our report found that the number of licensed child care centers open in 2022 exceeded the number open in 2019. This number increased by 3%. So, and while the number of licensed family child care homes, we did see continue to decline again in 2022 nationwide, the rate of decline was slower than in prior years. So some slightly positive news. And finally, that while the price of child care is far too expensive and out of reach for too many families, the rise in child care prices from 2021 to 2022 did not outpace inflation as it did in the previous year. We'll go to the next slide where we're going to dig into some Arizona specific data that came from this from our report on the price of care. Um, and in Arizona in 2022, our data found that for infants in care, the average price uh, in a family child care program was $8,840 a year. And in a center based program uh, for infants, that was much higher at four, uh, just over 14000 and looking at toddlers, the average price of child care in a family child care setting in Arizona was $7,800. While in a center-based program, that average uh, yearly price of care was $12,662. In Arizona, center-based care for an infant comprises 14% of family income for a married couple. We found that for single parent families, that, that uh, percentage of in, in income that childcare makes up is much higher at 40%. And we just wanna share that this is a little higher than the national average. So Arizona did have slightly higher um, income uh, average prices compared to the national average, which shows that across all states, childcare consumes 10% of a married couple's income and 33% for a single parent. And so again, 14 versus 10, and then 40 in Arizona of a, of a single family income versus 33% nationally. When compared to other household expenses in Arizona, childcare costs were higher than both housing and tuition at a public university. Move on to the next slide. So in the next slide, I wanna share some key takeaways going back to the national level data from our Catalyzing Growth Report. So some key policy takeaways uh, is that at the same time that supply was recovering in 2022, states were in the midst of administering relief funding under all three federal relief packages. And the biggest one, of course, being the American Rescue Plan Act. Our data shows evidence of national child care supply recovery when examining the number of center-based programs open between 2019 and 2022 suggesting that the 52 billion in total in child care fund relief funding really may have been impactful. It didn't just keep the sector afloat, but it allowed it to recover and grow. This is critical, critical data as we explore the impact of federal relief funds on the child care sector. We have, we have concrete evidence in this report that supply stabilized and not just stabilized, but it also grew compared to pre-pandemic numbers for center-based programs at the same time that relief funding was being dispersed and we saw a slower uh, decrease in family child care programs in that same time period. And so while we're on the topic of federal relief, I want to give you a picture of how uh, states have used this funding um, all across the country and where they are in spending this down. We'll move on to the next slide for that. We've been monitoring and collecting this information since 2020 at Child Care Aware of America. And it's no doubt that federal relief funding has been a game changer for child care and early learning. As a refresher, the child care sector was allocated relief funding under three uh, important federal uh, packages called CARES, SIRSA, and the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA as we've come to call it. 
These amounts range from 3.5 billion under CARES nationwide to 10 billion under SIRSA and then 39 billion under the American Rescue Plan Act to support those stabilization grants and that CCDF discretionary funding. I know Barbie is going to get into this more in her section, but all states, just to reiterate already, will hit a major deadline, spending deadline on this funding by September 30th of 2023 for CARES, SIRSA, and those ARPA stabilization grants. So this is a deadline that every single state across the country is facing. And then they have until the following uh, year in September 2024 to use remaining discretionary funding under ARPA. Many states are well on their way in spending even that discretionary funding that has that extra tail to, to next fall, um, despite, the, despite the, the extra time. So let's dig into how states are using this funding. Uh, overall, we have found that no two, uh, that states have leveraged the ARPA Act funds uh, and CARES and SIRSA to meet their unique needs, and that no two states are spending the dollars in the exact same way. Outside of stabilization grants, the most supported policies include expanding income eligibility thresholds for families, um, so more families qualify for childcare subsidy, improving provider payment practices by increasing reimbursement rates to meet higher percentile of market rate surveys, or in the case of Virginia, DC, and New Mexico, basing rates on a cost estimation analysis that reflects the actual true cost of care. We also see that states most commonly eliminated or significantly reduced those family co-pays, increased compensation and benefits for providers, um, and of course, there are so many other uses listed in the chart here. That's kind of a recap of the most common policies that we've seen. And in terms of where states are in spending this funding, an analysis by the U.S. Government Accountability Office from April of this year finds that $34.5 billion of the $52.5 billion allotted, which is 66% as of April, had been fully liquidated showing states are well on their way and successfully spending down these one-time um, funding increases. And of this amount, just $2 billion was estimated to still be unspent from CARES and SIRSA, those first two legislative packages, and that states had spent an estimated $20 billion of the $24 billion, so just $4 billion left as of April on those stabilization grants. And now that we are at the beginning of August with 60 days left uh, until this funding has to be spent, we anticipate this number is much higher than these April numbers. So I know Barbara's gonna dive into next about how Arizona is using this funding, but big picture, we are seeing that as remaining federal relief funds for childcare dwindle, some states are recognizing the need to continue policies initially funded with pandemic funds to increase early childhood education supply, affordability, quality, and compensation with the addition of state general funds. And in 2023, at least 22 governors included ECE in their state of the state addresses. Governors from Hawaii to Maine to Missouri, North Dakota, Ohio, all included funding increases for child care in their state budget proposals. And we're also seeing big headlines on where state legislatures and governors committed to child care this session now that many sessions have wrapped up. And this is happening in states like Louisiana, Illinois, Maine, Missouri, Montana, North Dakota, Vermont, and Washington. In many cases, like in Louisiana and Missouri, this new funding that states have included in their budgets this year is among the largest increases in state general funds they've ever committed to childcare. So it's a really big deal. We are starting to see childcare elevated at the state level in ways it hasn't before, and we can thank federal relief funding for paving the way. These increases are much to be celebrated, and it's great that many states view childcare as a bipartisan issue and are prioritizing state general funding to support expanded eligibility, reduced or waived co-pays for families, and those compensation supports for the workforce. And while this is great news in the states where these investments are being made, uh, I just want to note that these state-level investments, unfortunately, they're not happening in every state. And where they are happening, they are not as robust as federal relief investments have been, simply because states cannot make the same sweeping new investments that Congress can. We'll move on to the next slide. So over these next couple of slides, I want to also dig into what, what we're hearing from providers, so people uh, on the field, on the ground. 
Um, the most important data to share with you, of course, is, is how providers are, are impacted by federal relief funding, um, as you very well know and hopefully can share. So Child Care Aware of America's campaign to fight for child care funding is pairing the data from our latest report with provider videos on our social media channels and ensuring members of Congress receive their constituent stories. To support providers who want to advocate by telling their own story, we, are, we created a platform to collect and share these 90 second testimonials from providers about the impact of relief funding, specifically around stabilization grant funding. Move on to the next slide. Through these video submissions, providers are asked to respond to just four simple prompts uh, to provide information about their program, share how they've used the stabilization grants, share what this might mean for their program when this funding is no longer available, and finally, if additional funding was made available in the future, what would this mean for their program? On the next slide, we'll share uh, uh, what, we, what we're hearing so far from providers. Um, so we have received videos from providers of all kinds, including home-based centers and faith-based programs in 26 states. We are hearing how providers um, uh, have used this funding to hire quality staff, pay staff a little wage, and finally offer benefits like health, dental, retirement contributions, and paid time off. They're up purchasing new play materials and upgrading their flooring and playground equipment. They're paying down bills and, and, and rent and mortgage payments, all things that you are very well familiar with on this call. A consistent response has emerged among child care providers that this funding has been a critical lifeline to strengthen their businesses and support their staff in a way the sector hasn't experienced before. But we are also hearing deep concerns come from these testimonials about when this funding is no longer available, whether their programs will be able to continue retaining and recruiting staff and, re on, and remaining open and financially solvent when this funding eventually runs dry. And we know this feedback is very much in line with the results um, of, of the survey that NACI conducted in the fall of 12,000 early childhood educators, which shared that 43% of center directors and 37% of family child care providers said their program will be forced to raise tuition for working parents when stabilization grants end. Move on to the next slide. So I just wanna quickly share a quote we've heard from this project, provide some grounding to what we are hearing, although nothing new again, but I wanna share a quote from Juanita in Virginia who said, we did get the stabilization grant, which was for my center, a lifeline because we are losing about $30,000 a month because we cannot find the staff to fill the positions we have available. I don't think that without the stabilization grant, we would still be open and providing care and services to the children we care for. And I wanna share that we shared some of these quotes and the videos with, um, with a, staff, a congressional staff last week in a briefing. Move on to the next slide. These videos are an important part of our advocacy start strategy at the federal level to make the case for future investments. And hopefully it can be part of your state level advocacy strategy too. In recording their story, many providers are advocating for the first time in a very easy, low stakes way. And I think Michelle just dropped the link into the chat, but you can hear from the full playlist of these providers on our YouTube channel. We even have a two minute highlight reel that's again, two minutes, it's really fast and it's really powerful to listen to. And again, these have gone to members of Congress and we're also um, you know, we're sharing them on social media. Uh, but I do have an ask for you on this call. We could use a video uh, from a provider in Arizona and appreciate your help if you're interested in submitting a 90 second video. It's really easy. It can be recorded on a cell phone or a laptop or a tablet or your computer. Uh, we'll send the link in, in follow-up materials. But again, you go, you click, you, um, you start your video. There's four questions. You can redo it if you need to. And again, it's 90 seconds. All stuff, all information that you already know. And with that, I will pass it on, I think, to Barbie. Hi, good evening, Diane. <clears throat> Excuse me. Dan, uh, thank you so much, and Christina, for your great information and all the work that you do at the uh, at the federal level for all of us. It's um, a lot. It's a heavy lift, and we appreciate everything that you do. Uh, my name is Barbie Prenster. I'm the executive director for the Arizona Early Childhood Education Association, 
And uh, we are a trade association of 501c6. So my members are child care owners and uh, we represent law of the large national chains, small mom and pops, faith-based nonprofits, kind of the gamut of everybody that's operating child care centers in Arizona. We do not um, have homes as uh, members or we do not um, also deal with the public school system. So next slide, please. I'm gonna go through this a, a little bit faster than the, and just namely time, but we, um, we've we hit on some of the um, really important things that um, have already happened in Arizona. Um, so from a uh, perspective of good things that are happening for families in Arizona, I wanna highlight these five things that happened during this session um, that Governor Hobbs did sign into law. So uh, kids care program expansion, um, it, it uh, expanded eligibility with our, our um, what is called access, which is our um, Arizona Health Kids Care, uh, sorry, cost containment system. Um, it increased eligibility to 225% of the federal poverty level, providing health care to an additional 12,000 children. Um, all of this information comes from Children's Action Alliance, so I want to give them credit for um, uh, publishing all of this. Um, Arizona Home Visiting, the budget allocates two and a half million to support the Nurse Family Partnership which is super, super important for families, especially women that have just had babies. Um, re reducing financial barriers for our youth attempting to exit the ju juvenile justice system. Um, this will help offset costs if uh, somebody is in the uh, juvenile system that has some fines to pay um, that can be uh, burdensome for them. So that will help them pay for those. Positive parenting pilot program. Uh, the budget establishes a pilot program um, focusing on post-permanency placements uh, for children, and then um, going down the line to emergency shelter and transitional living. So uh, there's an increase in funding in that to provide better emergency shelter and transitional living um, options for children. Next slide, please. So those are some really good things that have been, that help, um, I think when we talk about childcare, um, but we talk about families in general because we have to take care of the whole family, not just um, the child care piece. So these are numbers that you saw Eric had put up before. This is uh, the uh, federal amount that, that Arizona has received um, in the three different buckets between the CARES Act, source of funding and ARPA funding. Um, it's been a, a, a lot of funding. Um, I tell people that I used to lose sleep because we didn't have enough funding and then I was losing sleep because we had a lot of funding and we want to spend it really wisely. Um, and make good decisions and things that uh, will impact Arizona's uh, providers, workers, and families. Next slide, please. So um, when our Division of Child Care through our de uh, Department of Eco Economic Security, they're the lead agency that um, receives all the funding from the federal government, they came up with, we had a, uh, some committees that gave them recommendations and so, they came up with about 30 strategies um, that would focus on expanding access to care, invest in quality, accelerate educational support and early childhood literacy, and then stabilize the child care network. So all of these 30 um, strategies that they came up with um, that will eventually sunset um, in September of 2024 were all fell into one of these four buckets here. Next slide, please. There we go. This is just, this is not everything, obviously, but these are kind of a, a bigger chunk of the, uh, the funding that we used. Um, first and foremost, we had the child care stabilization grants. And then um, after a year of having those, they also added in the workforce grants um, as well. That last payment just ended uh, last June or last month in June of 2023. I don't want to say last month because now we're in August, two months ago. Um, and the funding must be liquidated by this September 30th of 2023. There will be one additional um, grant that will come out. Um, I think the application process will happen in September for a one-time payment and providers will be able to choose if they want that payment in either October or January. And again, it will be very similar to the child care stabilization grants using for rent, salaries, utilities, um, things in that, 
that same nature that they were using before, but it's just kind of getting rid of that one last bucket of funding. Um, we, they did uh, raise our DES uh, reimbursement rates. The, our infant reimbursement rate is now the 75th percentile of the 2022 market rate survey. All um, the other ages, uh, one-year-olds, two-year-olds, preschoolers, and school-agers are the 75th percentile of the 2018 market rate survey. This also, what they did too last November, we now have, instead of having 144 rates, as we did across our state at one time, um, between the six districts and having full-time and part-time rates, we now have one statewide rate and everybody is paid at a full day, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, because like Diabra Pike County was notoriously paid 25% then, less than Maricopa County and the cost of living there is very expensive as well. Um, minimum wage is the same across our state with the exceptions of Flagstaff and Tucson. So it just really makes sense to be able to be able to pay everybody um, and it's more equitable to be paying everybody at the same rate statewide. There will be another market rate survey conducted next year. So we're looking forward to that. And then um, the other piece that has been really, really helpful is that if you are involved in our uh, quality first rating system and you are a three, four, five star center or nationally accredited, you're getting a 50% bump on your reimbursement rate. There has been uh, money used to expand our Quality First um, program. It was not able to uh, state, be a statewide model because we didn't have enough funding to do that. However, some of those expansion sites, the funding does end in June of 2024. Um, first Things First qu hasn't quite figured out how they're going to uh, manage that when that uh, funding ends. We're hoping for maybe a, a quality rating system that um, you could, providers might be able to buy into. And along with that expansion, scholarships were expanded as well, and uh, their reimbursement rates were um, increased up to the cost of quality, which has been super helpful. Um, we, uh, during the recession, um, our former governor um, got rid of all of our licensing funding out of our general fund. So we were self-funding our licensing, our borough of child care licensing for the last 10 years. And a larger provider would be paying almost $4,000 every three years for their license. We were the highest in uh, the US for that. So DES has been covering that fee. So now they pay a dollar per year until June of 2024. We are hoping that some sort of this type of payment will be able to continue. Um, and even asking up to um, and including asking um, the Department of Health Services Bureau of Child Care Licensing just to take back on this fee um, again and save let providers reinvest that money back into their center. There was an infrastructure grant through LIS. Uh, it was initially $30 million and then there, an additional $35 million was added from the first things first. Uh, providers, child care providers, licensed child care providers were able to apply for up to $300,000 for improvements to their um, playgrounds a new roof, uh, HVAC systems, new um, cots. I mean, the, the, the list goes on and on. So that has been uh, super helpful and also in being able to increase quality, um, especially in rural communities as well. There's been several liter literacy initiatives that have happened. I know the Dolly Spartan Reading Program has expanded, um, expansion in early childhood mental health. And then we've had uh, the work through the workforce. There, right now, there is um, scholarships for bachelor's degrees through First Things First. There's also a CDA program through CCI that is fully paid for, and you get $1,000 for completing it. And we've also just started uh, rolled out a new apprenticeship program through Central Arizona College as well. So this is just this isn't everything, but these are just the things that I really wanted to highlight that some of this funding has been used towards. It's been really, really helpful. Um, a lot, also along the workforce, we do have a workforce educational scholarship right now for um, if you're a staff member and you have children, then uh, your children can qualify for, um, for subsidy. And then also K-12 teachers in either uh, public or charter schools. If you make less than $65,000 as a family, you will also um, be eligible for free child care. So that's been really helpful too. And we're hoping that something an, around that can be, um, uh, can continue after all this funding ends. Next slide, please. So we currently have no general fund money 
that goes to early childhood education. And we have not for quite some time. Um, again, during the recession, um, Governor Brewer um, gutted that uh, bucket for low-income working families. Um, what we do have is about $7 million for the Department of Child Safety. Um, that is um, part, but that is, that's really all, all of that we have. So this next session, we're going to do a big ask. Um, we haven't landed on a dollar amount yet, but looking and reiterating what um, they are finding friends from Child Care of where we're talking about, we have um, very red states that are doing phenomenal things. North Dakota, Louisiana, Missouri, um, Idaho. I, it's really, um, and it is bipartisan, and it is really important that legislators understand that this is for families, this is part of the economy, this drives the workforce, and we're, we're going to have to have some serious messaging around that for both Republicans and Democrats, because we don't have very many, I think we maybe have two or three legislators that were around when we even had any funding for childcare. So nobody down there knows how it even works. So one of the things that we'll probably really ask for is increasing eligibility for Arizona families to be able to serve more children, um, continuing that educational workforce scholarship for um, teachers and for um, our staff to be able to receive a childcare subsidy, setting reimbursement rates to the 75th percentile of the current market rate survey um, or allowing rates to be set through an alternative true cost of care mechanism instead of the price of care, recruitment and tension, retention bonuses for child care providers, and then enrollment versus attendance-based reimbursement, which that part is part of this new um, proposal that I know that um, is coming through CCDBG. There's those three initiatives and that enrollment-based versus attendance-based is, is part of that. Um, and that would be really helpful for providers as well. Next slide, please. So we are one of the 10 fastest growing states in the nation and we're positioned to emerge from the pandemic with a strong and vibrant economy. Um, we have some really, um, I don't know how, if you, how you view some, some tax breaks, but for larger corporations, chip manufacturing, um, they're all coming here and they're coming um, with, a, with a force. And so we wanna be able to continue to welcome them to our state of Arizona, but we also wanna be able to offer them a really great um, childcare um, arena for zero to five. So some of this information is um, childcare issues result in an estimated $1.77 billion loss annually for Arizona's e economy. All of this information is from the US Chamber report that came out in November of 2021. I had that in a Twitter, but it didn't look like that it, it came on here. Um, we lose an estimated uh, 348 million annually in tax revenue um, due to our, our ch uh, childcare issues. Absences and employee turnover cost Arizona employers an estimated $1.42 billion per year. Um, approximately 6% of parents voluntarily left a job due to um, a childcare issue. 33% needed to make adjustments to their education due to childcare issues and 71% of parents reported missing work due to childcare issues in the past three months. Oh, thank you, Eric, for putting that in there. Um, it's a really, really good report um, and has um, really the economic factor um, worked in there. So um, I would encourage you to click on that link that Eric put in there because there's a, a US one and then there's one for every state as well. Next slide, please. Um, other states are investing. Oh, you know what? It doesn't show my, there's four. I think it's the, just the screen is so large that it's not showing the other two states that I have on there. Um, and so here's an example in Missouri, um, 56 million to start to expand preschool options to low-income children in the state. Governor Parson would also invest an upward of 78 million to increase childcare subsidy rates to childcare providers across the state, which would increase compensation and stabilize supply for working families. Um, and in Louisiana, they approved 44 million in new funding for childcare that will save 3,500 slots that um, they were using with COVID relief funding. So that's just an example of being able to continue some of the funding mechanisms that, um, that we've been able to uh, you know, come up with during COVID. Um, and I know Louisiana also has um, some really great things about tax credits for families as, as well too. 
I had two other states on there, but just the way that the screen is showing, it's not showing me what they were. I know one of them was North Dakota. And I think the thing that impresses me the most about North Dakota is one of their biggest advocates in helping them get this to their, their um, legislation to the finish line was their Chamber of Commerce. And so those are the people that in the business community that we really need to work on and engaging and engaging well with and partnering with to um, help our legislator and uh, legislature um, understand uh, the needs that we have in our state for early childhood. Next slide, please. That might be the last one. I don't remember. Oh, well, there you go. It went to two, two slides. So Montana, um, House Bill 648, cap co-pays at 9% of a family's income and adjust the way providers are reimbursed, um, as well as expand eligibility to 185% of the federal poverty level, which is an increase of $7 million per year. And then there's the one from North Dakota, uh, 66 million comprehensive package to, adjust, to address the availability, affordability, and quality of child care as a barrier to workforce participation. So um, big things happening in other red states. So we need to get on the bandwagon and hitch up our horses and ride into the sunset with these other states that are doing this and doing it well um, and um, come together and, and make sure that that happens for the families in Arizona. Next slide, please. Thank you, Barbie. Uh, I yeah. think it's uh, uh, it is it's my pleasure to turn it over to Sonia Montoya <laughs> with the Arizona Head Start Association to tell us a little bit about what Head Start needs moving forward. So, Sonia, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Eric. I am really happy to be here today to represent the Arizona Head Start Association, um, but I'm also here wearing another hat, and that is of a former Head Start student. When we talk about early childhood education and the benefits and the opportunities that it provides children as well as staff, the benefits are unlimited, and so it's really my pleasure tonight. If we can go to the next slide, I can tell you a little bit about Head Start and its needs. And what you're going to see on this slide is a large number, 16.4 billion is what our National Head Start Association anticipates Head Start's need is. And when we really break it down and really provide the, the data behind all of this, like everybody has said, inflation has hit everybody in the workforce. And so the cost of living adjustment is just as important for our early childhood Head Start and early Head Start staff. Our workforce compensation adjustment, when you look at the early childhood field, we are typically in the bottom 10% of the workforce in terms of pay. And so the adjustment needed to retain and compensate these teachers that work so hard uh, to take care of our children and families every single day is critical. When we talk about quality improvement funding, it probably has taken a different toll from the standpoint of we need qualified staff, we need resources and supports and help that can help promote uh, the safety and well being of children from the standpoint of trauma from the COVID 19 epidemic and what the lasting effects are. Um, it is crucial in our early childhood programs that we have that so that we can provide those quality and stable services to the entire state and to the entire nation. And lastly, we talk about our tribal colleges and universities. We cannot forget them. They also have a tremendous need to hire like qualified staff to staff these classrooms and tribal programs across the country. And we know that if we invest in our universities and our colleges, they will then help to turn around and really support those future staff and current staff that are so desperately needed across the country and in our state to maintain the great work that the early childhood field does. Again, Head Start has been here for many, many years. And we want to continue to support our country's most vulnerable children and their families so that they can attain the success that they so deserve and enter that workforce strong, enter and receive that education later on in life that is so crucial to sustaining our, our way of life. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over to Eric. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, I hope everyone will join me uh, in thanking Diane. Uh, Christina, Barbie, and Sonia 
uh, for sharing a little bit about what's happening at the federal level as well as at the state level and what our communities need, uh, what childcare programs, what Head Start children, what families need uh, moving forward uh, as we uh, look into what's gonna happen after those federal relief funds begin to sunset uh, starting this fall. Importantly, the most, uh, I think, impactful piece that we want you to take away from this training is, is that federal, uh, federal relief funds have helped stabilize the childcare field. And in fact, they also helped improve uh, the capacity of early childhood programs to better serve uh, young children and families, to improve access to quality childcare, and to uh, ensure that the early childhood profession was well supported and well compensated. So just imagine what we could do if we continue, if we um, advocate for and get uh, federal uh, and state public investments in childcare. Imagine the great uh, work that could happen to build on those successes of the pandemic, uh, of what we've been able to achieve during the pandemic. So. What do we still need? Uh, we need our state legislature here in Arizona uh, to invest our taxpayer dollars to support state-funded affordable quality childcare, uh, helping ensure that uh, resources and investments are available to childcare programs to improve access uh, for families so that they're not paying a significant amount of their income on something that they rely on every day to get to work or get to school and uh, contribute to their own well-being as a family. Uh, we need in those investments to be able to support worthy wages and benefits uh, for the early childhood workforce who does the essential work of caring for young learners uh, and their families um, day in and day out. So we need the state legislature to invest our taxpayer dollars uh, to support that state funded affordable quality childcare. And at the federal level, we need our Congress people, uh, our Congress to appropriate significant sustained investments in children families and the childcare workforce. So we're looking at it from two levels here. Uh, as you heard from our colleagues at Child Care Aware of America, now is a very opportune time uh, to engage with Congress people. They are back in Arizona uh, from a recess uh, in the Congress. Uh, and so now's a great time to pick up the phone, email, tweet, uh, or X, I guess it's called now. Um, you can uh, use the templates that Child Care Aware or NAYC offers uh, for us to um, uh, to make our voices heard on behalf of young children. And it's also a perfect time to set up a site visit, uh, inviting a local lawmaker or a congressional representative to come visit your program, your Head Start, your child care program, uh, your district-based program, your family child care. Uh, invite them to come see what it's like uh, in the day of an early child educator and show them firsthand the benefits of quality early learning for young children and their families. So to learn more about how to do that, uh, we've included a uh, the handout, the 10 tips for setting up a site visit uh, in the uh, Google link uh, with the handouts. Uh, you can also check out um, AZ AEYC's uh, recent uh, article uh, in NAYC's uh, Young Children magazine about how to set up uh, a site visit uh, with uh, elected officials. So reach out to us. We're happy to help you get that set up if you need some additional support. And as we close out the, the webinar tonight, we want to thank you. Uh, for being uh, an early childhood professional, for helping uh, take good care of our children, our families, and our communities. And we invite you and encourage you to make your voice heard on behalf of our field by reaching out and uh, sharing stories of the successes uh, you've experienced during the pandemic, thanks to these federal relief funds, and making it very clear that we need significant sustained investments in order to continue to build on that work and to ensure that children, families, our profession, and our communities thrive. As we wrap up, we invite you to complete a brief survey uh, to receive your certificate. The survey link will be included in the description and with the YouTube video. Uh, for the people who are joining us live here in the session, we will put it in the chat box. Um, it's just a brief three to four minute survey. You'll enter your information and your uh, Arizona Early Childhood Workforce Registry ID number uh, if you'd like us to mark you as attended in the registry. And then once you complete the survey, it'll bring you to a page that has a link to the Certificate of Professional Development. So we can mark you in the registry or you could download and or you could download your certificate. Again, thank you for joining us. Uh, we wish you well and we hope to see you out there advocating on behalf of uh, children, families and our profession. Take care and thanks for joining us.